Starship is the key to humanity. It holds the opportunity for you to set foot on Mars as well as any other planet in the universe. But before accomplishing that, Starship will have to conquer the nearest celestial body to Earth, which is the Moon. This will serve as a springboard to transform Starship into a holy grail of the universe, turning our human species into a multi-planetary civilization. So, how exactly will Starship go to the Moon? Let's find out everything in today's episode of Alpha Tech. Earth's gravity well serves as the starting point for any space travel. Gravity is a curvature of space, where a planet such as Earth curves the space around it into a circular form the way a bowling ball makes a round depression on a mattress. In simpler terms, a gravity well is essentially the gravitational force of the Earth that a spacecraft must overcome to escape the gravitational influence of the planet. The moon's riding the walls of Earth's gravity well, but it also has a smaller well of its own. So getting to the moon requires climbing out of the gravity well of Earth and falling into the gravity well of the moon without flying off into deep space. The journey from Earth to the moon commences with a critical phase, the launch and achieving Earth orbit. To understand this process better, we use an important concept called delta V, which represents the change in velocity required for a spacecraft to maneuver between different points in its trajectory. The significance of delta V lies in its role as a measure of the energy needed to alter the spacecraft's speed and direction, making it a crucial parameter for calculating the fuel and propulsion requirements for various maneuvers. If the Earth is moving at a speed of 30 kilometers a second and you accelerate your spacecraft to 31 kilometers a second, then you have a delta V of 1. Similarly, if you decelerate your spacecraft relative to Earth and travel at 29 kilometers a second, you also have a delta V of 1. However, if you launch from the surface of the Earth at a speed of 1 kilometer a second, you won't start rising into the solar system. Instead, you will float above the Earth's surface because gravity and atmospheric drag are holding you down. These natural forces affect the amount of delta V required to maneuver the spacecraft, which is why it's so challenging to go from the surface of the Earth into outer space. SpaceX's Starship, propelled by the Super Heavy booster, plays a pivotal role in this stage. The delta V required to reach a typical low Earth orbit is around 9.4 kilometers a second, which is a significant acceleration and that's why our Starship needs the massive power of the Super Heavy booster during launch. Its immense power is harnessed to overcome Earth's gravity and propel the spacecraft to the initial velocities required for interplanetary travel. Well, we are in Earth's orbit, a few hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface, but the spacecraft is still influenced by Earth's gravity. The spacecraft's velocity is what keeps it in orbit. If it slows down, it'll start falling back toward Earth, and if it speeds up, it moves to a higher orbit. To reach a geostationary orbit altitude, the spacecraft would need a delta V of approximately 2.44 kilometers a second. However, reaching the moon, which is much farther away, requires a significantly higher delta V. In fact, a delta V of around 3.14 kilometers a second is typically needed to escape Earth's gravitational influence and travel to the orbit of the moon. Once in Earth orbit, a crucial strategy is employed to maximize the spacecraft's capabilities. Instead of embarking directly on the journey to the moon like Apollo missions with a single burst of acceleration, SpaceX incorporates a refueling step in Earth orbit. When it reaches orbit with its full payload, the only remaining fuel is in the two header tanks, just enough for it to use to burn out of orbit and land. However, it's only the plan with Starship HLS, as it doesn't return to Earth, but lingers in lunar orbit. But as for using Starship to directly transport cargo and humans on the lunar surface and return to Earth, it needs to be refueled before changing to a new orbit. This refueling session serves to replenish the spacecraft's fuel reserves, ensuring it has the required delta V for the subsequent stages of the mission. The additional fuel becomes instrumental in achieving the necessary velocity changes during the journey to the moon. This process requires two specialized Starship designs to be used here. A tanker, a standard Starship, but with cargo holds filled with methane and oxygen tanks capable of holding around 150 to 200 tons of propellant. Its task is to lift additional propellant into orbit. A fuel depot, which we believe has been tested at Boca Chica, has no wings, no heat shields, and no holes to launch satellites or anything else. 
So it seems like it's intended to be launched into orbit and stay there indefinitely. Fuel transport ships will dock with it and unload their cargo. Assuming it uses the main cargo holds along with cargo space to store propellant, it could store enough propellant to supply fuel for at least two starships on Mars or up to four starships on the moon. Having fuel depot starships in orbit around the moon is another option, but getting them there and filling them up would be a considerable pain. The tankers would have to fly to Earth orbit, refuel so they can make it into lunar orbit, offload their fuel into a lunar fuel depot, and then return to Earth. Suppose it takes four tanker launches to fuel a starship to the moon and back. You'd need four launches Earth orbit fuel depots to launch one tanker to lunar orbit and back. So it would take 16 tanker launches to fully fuel a lunar starship from a lunar orbit fuel depot, which starts to get silly even by SpaceX standards. Finally, Starship will execute a landing on the surface of the moon, and this is also a stage that is not easy. One of the primary obstacles involves the need to decelerate the spacecraft as it approaches the moon. The moon's atmosphere is extremely thin, comparable to the distant outer reaches of Earth's atmosphere where the International Space Station orbits. This means that slowing down relies on expelling a lot of propellant. Without an atmosphere, we can't glide down. Nothing slows you down except your engine. Adjusting the thrust and engines must be carefully considered and handled with the utmost caution because they also face another obstacle, which is the lunar dust. Here on Earth, if you pointed a rocket engine at a bunch of dust, gravels, and rocks, the thick atmosphere of air that surrounds our planet would slow down the smaller particles first, while the larger particles would cut through the wind resistance and travel the greatest distances. On the moon, it's the opposite. There's no air surrounding the lunar surface, just a vacuum. So if a bunch of particles were to get sped up to high speeds, the smaller particles would travel the fastest and at the greatest distances, while the bigger rocks would soon be felled by the moon's weak gravity. That's exactly what happens when you use a rocket engine to lower down to the lunar surface. The engineers have found that a large lander about the size of the Apollo Lunar Lander module, capable of spewing out gas at around 2,400 meters a second, can propel rocks and gravel-sized particles up to 10 to 100 meters a second, sending them tremendous distances. But the fine dust and sand can speed up to 1,000 meters a second, propelling them hundreds of kilometers away, or even distributing them all over the moon. The challenge may become even more difficult if Starship is much larger than the Apollo Lunar Lander. The result of Starship touching down on the moon, even more dust and larger particles being blown away at a faster speed. However, this is not an unsolvable issue for SpaceX and Elon Musk. The proposed design for Starship landing on the moon will not use the six high-thrust Raptor engines for lunar landing. Instead, it'll utilize the side thruster control attached to the spacecraft's side. These are similar thrusters used for maneuvering or changing direction in space or vehicle re-entry into the atmosphere. The RSC thrusters are positioned high on the 50-meter tall vehicle to create distance with their thrust compared to the surface. By following this approach, instead of relying on the massive Raptor engines for the final landing, the spacecraft can protect the landing surface from the concentrated thrust of its landing engines. Of course, as with everything SpaceX, designs are always subject to change, so this may not be the final method. Overall, Starship will have such a process for landing on the moon. Until the Starship reaches orbit and can perform the refueling process, the challenging of landing on the moon is indeed not a difficult task. But when Starship can carry out standalone missions on the moon at significantly lower cost compared to what NASA plans to spend on the Artemis program, is there a need for a middleman? Why not use the $3 billion spent annually on SLS and launch Starship dozens of times instead? What do you think about this? That's all for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please let us know what you think in the comments section below. Your feedback is very important to us and helps us make better videos for you. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.